Good morning. We welcome you this morning to our worship service here at uh, First Baptist Church here in Hope Mill, North Carolina. We welcome all of those who have uh, tuned in to listen to our service this morning. Those folks in uh, Florida and South Carolina and Georgia and the rest of North Carolina, uh, we welcome you this morning at our worship service. We thank God for you. We thank you for your support. And more importantly, during these uh, trying times, we thank you for your prayers. We need your prayers. And so we are grateful that we have uh, you are praying for us, and we know that you are. We just thank the Lord for a beautiful day. Uh, it is pretty much, uh, I call it beautiful. Maybe some of you would disagree with me. But it's a little chilly outside and a little uh, sprinkling of rain that feels like little ice chips. <laughs> And so this morning, I want to welcome you to a warm uh, worship in a warm North Carolina, if you're watching and if you're listening this morning. Uh, we are going to make it through this uh, today, and we're going to make it through in years to come. But I welcome you this morning. Um, <clears throat> will you take a moment with me now as we go to prayer, and we present this message as an act of worship to the Lord our God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before your presence this morning. There is something in your word that you have for each of us. It may not be the same for everyone, but someone, someplace, will get something out of your word today. Lord, we ask your blessings upon the hearers, the readers, and those who are engaged in worshiping you this morning. We pray for every minister, every Bible class, every home worship, everywhere the name of Jesus Christ is proclaimed today, in churches of all denominations, we pray, O oh Lord, your blessings be upon them. We pray for our country. Like anywhere else, we pray for peace, not only here, but also abroad. We pray for our men and women who are in harm's way, who are serving this great nation. We thank you for this opportunity to worship. We thank you for our history. We thank you, O Lord, and we give you praise. We pray for our first responders. We lift up our law enforcement. We lift up our government, our presidents, their leaders. Lord, we lift up those that are sick, that cannot be with us, or those that are confined. We lift them up to you. We ask you, O oh Lord, those on the rescue mission, those who are doing the ambulatory service, we ask you to be with them in their families, O oh Lord. Bless our service today. May the presence of the Almighty God, the living of the Holy Spirit, be present with us as we now take a moment to listen to your word, words of truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'll be reading from you this morning in Mark chapter 1, Mark's gospel chapter 1, starting with verse 29 to 37. And I'll be reading from the NIV version, New International Version. And this is where it reads, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the house of Simon's and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her and took her by the hand and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Some of your translations might have immediately that evening, after sunset, the people brought Jesus. All the sick and demon-possessed, the whole town gathered at the door. Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not allow, allow, allow the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, 
left the house and went off to a solitary place, solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companion went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go elsewhere. Let us go somewhere else to the nearby village so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Um, and reading our text this morning, it's, it, it's always good to find the context in which this particular scripture that Mark writes about, or this particular story, it's always good to find those other nuggets of pieces that would add on to the message this morning. My sermon title, We Are Raised to Serve. And, and, and in doing so, it'll help us follow the book of Mark all, basically all through all 16 chapters. So we start this morning in, the, in, in, when, in, in, John, excuse me, in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus says, the time has come. The kingdom of God is nearby. Repent, believe the good news. Repent, believe the good news. That was the gospel. It's here. The kingdom of God is with us. The kingdom of God is nearby. It's near us. This is what Mark was telling his disciples. And after the call of Jesus' uh, disciples in, in Mark chapter 21 through 28, those verses, Mark 1, 21 to 28, you see there where Jesus goes into the synagogue and he begins to preach and he begins to teach. And while teaching, those who observed his teaching and his, and his preaching began to acclaim that, that uh, he talked or he spoke or he talked like one with authority. Jesus' words were so powerful. His speech and his oracy was so powerful, powerful that those who heard him separated his preaching from the preaching of the scribe and the Sadducees. Jesus preached as one with authority, meaning that his words were so powerful that it caused a stir in the heart of the listener. Not only do we find within that context, remember I said the kingdom of God is near you. The kingdom of God began to put his actions inside the synagogue. Here the people claim Jesus' authority. He talks as one who is not a novice. He talks as one who has the experience. He spoke as one who felt and believed what he was preaching and what he was talking about. The listeners was tuned in. They were mesmerized by the way he spoke. But not only that, inside that same scene, there was a man there who was demon-possessed. Jesus' preaching was so strong that even the demons began to cry out and began to yell and began to, to identify Jesus. Have you come to torment us? Have you come on this earth to judge us? Those were the words of the demons. Jesus quieted them, however, and told them to keep silent. Jesus didn't need demons to authenticate his identity. He didn't need the applause of the devil himself to identify who he was. He knew who he was. He was the son of God who had come in flesh for the sins of mankind to be the sacrifice, to be the atonement for sin. Now, this brings us to the story this morning of Simon's mother-in-law who lay in bed with a fever. Our text tells us this morning 
that she lays there in bed with this fever. Now, for many of us today, we will take that word fever to mean just our temperature going up a little bit. But our temperature rising to 104 and more can be very dangerous, not only to the brain, but also to the heart. We do not know what caused this lady fever to go up. But we do know that she was Simon Peter's mother-in-law. She was somebody. She was a person of significance. She was a mother. Perhaps a grandmother. She was somebody's daughter. She was an individual that mattered. She was an ordinary woman. But she was sick with the fever. She was sick with the fever. And being sick with that fever can cause death. Some of you know what it's like to be sick. Some of you right now are suffering with different ailments, and you know the pain of what it means to be bedridden. You know what it means to uh, the feel like when you can't do the things that you used to do. The nice walks, as simple as a walk. The nice the energy to be able to get up and about and do the things that you really enjoy. When you are sick, you're incapacitated. This fever had Simon's mother-in-law bedridden, perhaps almost to the point of death, almost to the point of death. That's what sickness does to us. It can rob you. It can rob you of the things that you love. It can rob you of the people that you love. Sickness of any kind, but particularly this particular sickness in that day, a fever. They didn't have the antibiotics that we have today to treat fevers and other things. They were simply at the mercy of the Almighty God. But remember I told you in verse 1 through 15, verse 1, verse 15, when Jesus said the kingdom of God has come and the kingdom of God is near you, repent and believe the gospel. Here, number one, here's the second act of the kingdom of God demonstrating its power. It demonstrated in the synagogue when the man was demon-possessed was delivered. Now we see the power of the kingdom of God in the life of a woman who has fever. Scripture tells us that Jesus went over and lifted her up. All through the book of Mark, that phrase, lifted up, all through the book of Mark, you will see lifted up, and you would also see another word immediately. Immediately, when Jesus lifted her, the fever left. It was no delay, there was no cooperation period. That was none. She was raised to serve. In those days, it was important that when a guest comes to your home, that you were able to serve them. The most embarrassing thing that could happen to you, that when guests would arrive at your home and you had nothing for them, and you showed no hospitality. That would have been the talk of the community. Jesus knew exactly what this lady needed. He knew that she needed to be restored. Just as Jesus knows that you and I need to be restored. We need to be restored to our rightful place. 
We need to be restored in our rightful spirit. In our rightful place is our relationship with God. Jesus raises us. He raised us. He has the power to raise us. Now, I know that there are some folks who will say, I have prayed for individuals, and I prayed and I prayed, and they died. I've asked Jesus to heal them, and he didn't. I had a friend of mine who's deceased, and he had cancer. And I remember him saying to me one day that if God did not heal him, that God must be lying. I remember standing over his casket, and I said to him, I said, my dear brother, you are free. You are free. There's no more cancer. There's no more ailments. There's no more pain. There's no more, there's no more. you are free. Wow. Jesus come to set us free. Jesus comes to raise us up. Some of us been down so long. Some of us, our heads been hanging down so long. All we know is the floor. All we know is the ground that we walk on. Some of us been down so long, we've allowed other people to come into our lives, and they have caused us to look down so long, we don't know what it's like to look up or hear the birds twerping in the trees. But I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus can heal you. Jesus can heal you if you so desire. And we understand this, there are more than one kind of healer. As I said to my friend who funeral out there, you're healed. You may not have been healed physically, but spiritually you are healed. Jesus is always interested in our spiritual healing. That is forgiveness of our sins, restoring us spiritually back to the Father in a relationship with God, because he knows eventually all human beings die. I remember hearing about Tony Evans' wife. Before she passed, she had a recovery period, or this a remission, for three years. She was cancer-free. The Panthers football coach, Rivera, well, it used to be the Panthers. He's now the Washington Redskins or the Washington coach. But he also was diagnosed with cancer. Come back on the news that he is cancer-free. We don't know how long that'll last. But we do know one thing. We're not here forever whether it be three years, five years, or ten years, our time will come up, our time will end somewhere. And just because a person is not healed physically does not mean that they're not healed spiritually. This whole thing about being healed, we get it confused sometimes. God has a right to do what he want to do. Yeah, there are certain people that we have prayed for and they've been healed. There are other people that you have prayed for and they die. You can't use Jesus for a magic wand. Jesus heals whom he so desires. Job, all the stuff that he went through, Job is a good example of sticking to it even when things are going wrong. 
Job is a good example of, of hanging in there, even at the worst of times. Job is a good example of a man who, who conversed with God, but he was a good man. He was desired to believe that God, that no matter what happened, whether he lived or whether he died, God was in control. That's faith, my friend. But this woman was restored. She loved her job. She loved waiting. Not only did she wait on tables and serve food, food, but she became a follower of Jesus. Jesus raised you up to follow him. Jesus raises us up so that we can carry on with the norms and the duties of everyday life. He raises us up so that we can enjoy our families and friends. And, and he raises us up. But more importantly, he forgives us for our sins. The other morning I got up and I was reading in my Bible. And a thought occurred to me. Out of this big universe, out of all the galaxies, in space, in all the, 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 the world, our physical world, but the, 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 the galaxy world, I ask myself a question. Maybe you have to. Who am I? Who am I in the midst of the vastness, the greatness, of the almighty God that he created. Who am I? Who are you? And I said to myself, I'm not even a pebble. I'm not even a pebble. In my own rights. But in the eyes of God, out of all that he's created, he still looks down on you and me. He can pinpoint who we are. And he can heal us on the spot. He knows you. You're no secret. No matter how vast the world is and how big it is, and the galaxies and going and on, the moons and the stars, you matters to God. That's who I am. To the world, I may not mean anything. Doubt it. But I'm not worried about that. I'm so thankful that I can have a heavenly father to talk to. And I hope that you are. This woman needed healing. Jesus met her needs. He'll meet your needs. But he may meet them in a different way. He'll heal you, but he may not heal you the way that he heals someone else. You may have to prescribe, uh, 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 adhere to the doctor's uh, uh, advice on what to do to be healed. You may have to have surgery to be healed. We pray and we pray. Sometimes nothing seems to happen. There's a book written by David Seaman, professor at Asbury Theological Seminary. And he wrote a book called Damage Emotions. In the first chapter of that book, he talks about how our emotions have been damaged. People who are older, grown up, who have kids and grandkids, but they still suffer from 
damage emotions. Emotions that have been inflicted on them without their will. Things that have been happened to them with someone who is more powerful than they were. He said, damage. He has seen athletes. He's seen lawyers. He's seen ministers. He's seen some of the best of Christian people, but their emotions have been damaged. How do you deal with damaged emotions? One of the things he says, you stop running. You stop running from yourself. Stop thinking that if you move to another neighborhood, you're going to be better. Stop thinking that if you go to Alaska, you're going to be better. I'd love to go there. (laughs) Stop thinking that if you go somewhere else, that your life is going to be better when you're carrying the demons with you. You're not going to be better. You got to face it. You got to face what you're running from. You're running from your past? Turn around and face it. Look the ugly monster in the, fire, in the eye and face it. And admit that that's who you are. The only way that you can find spiritual healing is when you come to the point in your life where you're able to admit that you have your own demons. Jesus raise us up so we can have life. So we can have joy. So we cannot be prisons of ourselves and prisons of somebody else. We become victims and we live like victims. We live like cripples. All because damaged emotions. trying to find the right person, marry the right person, that will not change the damaged emotions in your heart. Until that is squared away, until that is faced and dealt with, you'll always be trying to find somewhere, someplace, some people to give you what they don't have. They don't have it. They're bankrupt. Only Jesus has it. Let me go on to my second point here. Notice it says in our scripture text. I can go on and on with this sermon, even just that little bit. It says that that evening, after sunset, the people brought Jesus, all the sick and demonic possessed, brought them all. Sound like a whole town that evening. Why, why evening? Why not during the daytime? The, the, the evening represent, as they're getting ready to celebrate the, past, uh, the, the, the Sabbath day. And at the end of the Sabbath, which the uh, beginning of the Sabbath, the first Sabbath day, that evening, by the way, Because in their religion, Jews were taught that any work would be a violation of the Sabbath. Any work. Even if they carried someone on a mat, that was considered work. But at sunset, they were free to carry the sick, the lame, the blind. They they, they were free. They were free to anticipate a battle day. So they came to Jesus at night. Scripture tells us that Jesus healed them. He didn't heal them all. The scripture tells me that he healed many. I don't know why 
The word all was not in there, but it doesn't say all. Jesus don't always heal everybody. There are some people he heals and some he doesn't. Sometimes we have to let God be God. Not sometimes. We just need to let God be God. He knows better about you than you know about yourself. He knows your future better than you can ever predict. Scripture says that the whole town gathered at the door. That's in Capernaum. I don't know what the population was, but the whole town, they heard of Jesus' fame. Remember what I said before in 115, the kingdom of God is near you, and everywhere Jesus went, he was spreading that kingdom of God. There was something magical about him. He raised a woman who has a fever. He just touches her and she raises up. He, heard, he, he, he cast out a demon in a synagogue. People heard about this. Let's see if he can heal my son or my daughter, my wife. So we take him to Jesus, and the scripture says he healed many to demonstrate that the kingdom of God was near. Did y'all get that? All these miracles that Jesus performed was to, to, was to say to the people, the kingdom of God is here now. That was a time when people died in their illness. There were times when demon possession caused people to commit suicide. There was a time where uh, there was no hope. They would chain people and lock them away and, and put them away, and they would act like animals. There was a time when people had no hope. They lived in darkness, but all of a sudden, Jesus comes on the scene, and he brings the kingdom of God with him. And the kingdom of God had power. It had power. People were able to go to Jesus, and he healed many. Not everybody. Not everybody will be healed physically. My pastor, does you mean that we give up praying? No, 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 no. Don't stop praying. We're going to get into that later. Don't stop praying. Prayer is the key. Prayer gives you a sense of direction. Prayer gives you a sense of purpose. Prayer will do more for you than all the talk in the world. Prayer will do more for your family members than any economic system that we can have to supply all our needs. Prayer will change things in your life. In James, it talks about those who are sick, those who are, that are unhappy. And it talks about it specifically about healing. Let the elders of the church go and pray for that individual who is sick. And the ones that are sick, they need to confess, it says. If they have done anything, they need to confess their sin so that it will expedite the healing. Sometimes our healing is slow because we have not confessed our sins. Sometimes our healing takes longer because we have not taken a look at ourselves internally. Sometimes our healing takes longer because we have not admitted that we are guilty or that we are sinners. It's not until we are able to say, Lord, I've sinned. Have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sins. And in the people that I've sinned against, the people that I've hurt in my lifetime, 
I ask your forgiveness, and I ask that they forgive me. There was a show the other day on television I watched where a young man, his father, was killed while he was just an infant. He was an infant, and his father was holding him in his arms. And a man went up to him and shot his father in the head with the child in his arms. All through life. He's a grown man now, but he talks about all through life he went to alcohol and drugs and, and tried to erase. And he had no memory of what happened. And he would go to family members, you know, ask them to explain to him what happened, how did it happen. But no one would. Finally, he had a relative that he talked to who helped him who helped him and went through graphic by graphics what happened. But he was an infant. He never knew his father. And it had such an impact on his upbringing. All through his life, he had a sense of guilt, anger. But it wasn't until he faced it it wasn't until he began to look into it. He said, finally, one day he was driving in his truck. And as he was driving along, he said, all of a sudden, it seemed as though every weight, every anxiety, every bit of anger, every bit of revenge, it seemed as though someone joined him in that truck and they touched him. You know what he said? I'm free. I'm free. No longer I hold anger. No longer do I hold grudges. No longer do I uh, uh, hold anger against the person who killed my dad, but I forgive them. He said, I'm free. Jesus freed a whole community. They were out of work. They couldn't go to work. Not only did they suffer, but their employers, the employers suffered as well. The people that they worked for, these people were coming to Jesus to be healed so that they can get their lives back together. That's what Jesus does. But he don't heal us for a selfish reason. Jesus' healing always has a connection. What do I mean by that? That means that if he heals you, he expects something of you. Not like when I was in the army and we had what they call foxhole prayers. You know, my first deployment to the Gulf War, we had a lot of foxhole prayers. People were embracing every kind of religion just in case uh, they missed one, that the other one would work. Foxhole prayers, you make promises to God while you're in trouble. In the moment that he delivers you or heals you, you're about your way. But let me tell you something. Some of these people that came to Jesus, they were the same people. They were probably some of the same people who said, crucify him. Some of the same people who, who, who ridiculed him. But what did he do? He healed them. He healed them to give them a better... A, a, a sense of health so that they can better worship God. So that they can better be a person in their community. God created us to be part of a bigger picture. God created us not to be isolated or have our own little church, our own ethnicity. 
but rather he created so that we can be part of a bigger picture of our community. Harriet Tubman one of, was one of the great American heroes of the 19th century. Showing remarkable courage, she guided more than 300 fellow slaves to freedom after she first escaped by crossing over into the free territory in the United North. Not content to simply enjoy her own freedom, she ventured back into slave states 19 times to lead friends and families and strangers to freedom, sometimes guiding people on foot all the way to Canada. What drove Tudman to such brave action? A woman of deep faith, she at one time said, I always told God, I'm going to hold steady on you, and you have got to see me through. Her dependency on God's guidance as she led people out of slavery was a hallmark of her success. Jesus saves us so that we can lead people out of the sin of slavery. He heals us and he, 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 he saves us so that we can be a conduit of hope for those that are lost, those that are in drugs, whose marriages are in trouble. Jesus healed. The greatest joy you can give in this world is a joy, a, 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 a sense of a peace, a sense of purpose. What is your purpose? What legacy will you leave behind? More importantly, what spiritual legacy? What will the people say about you when you die? What will your children say? What will strangers who barely knew you may happen to hear of your funeral, but they come, what will they say about you? We are here to build eternal consequences. We are here to build our lives on what is to come, not what is. That's why Jesus heals us. This is why he raises us up. Notice in this text, I think it's very important, and we often miss it. Out of all the commotion, out of all the things that's going on, look what it says in verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. That word solitary. He went to a place where it was just he and God. Jesus depended on God the Father. Jesus was able to, to break away from the crowd and pray. Some of us think that we are so invisible. We think that we have all the answers for everybody. We think that we can handle everybody's problems. But you're not God. Even Jesus sought time to rest. Even Jesus sought time to present himself before God the Father so he can understand his mission. Oftentimes we get up in the morning we don't even say a prayer. We get up in the morning and death door is waiting right for us. 
You don't know when it's going to be your last time. At least you ought to say a prayer. We get up in the morning and we think that we own the whole world. <laughs> we think that the world is ours. We created it. It centers around us and what we feel and what we think and what we are going through if though no one else is going through anything. You're not the only one having financial problems. You're not the only one having marital problems. You're not the only one that's having bad children. You're not the only one. But sometimes we act like it. Sometimes we live like it. In essence, we know nothing. We know nothing. We don't know anything. But we act like we do. Let me tell you something. The scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 5, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. Casting all your cares on him because he cares for you, but humble yourself. Jesus lived in a submission of humility and hum humbleness. He could have stayed around for the party. He could have stayed around and said, the fish are biting, man. We're not going anyplace. We are going to stay here and celebrate. But instead, he prayed and he got directions. Could it be that many of our decisions that we have made and things have fallen apart because we never went to God first? We never consulted with him. Could it be the financial problems that we find ourselves in is because we never talk to God about our finances? Could it be that the marriage that we're in is that we marry someone because we thought that we loved, but we never talk to God about the person that we're about to marry or that we marry? This is not to say that you're going to get a divorce, okay? It's simply, simply saying that we make decisions and we expect God to bail us out. We need to pray. We need to pray for our loved ones. We need to pray for our enemies. There are people you don't like, and there are people that don't like you. Don't think that it's just one way. People don't like you either. They don't like me. Jesus prayed. He knew his mission. And many of us today live as though we don't have a mission. We live as though we don't have an operation plan. God has given us an operation plan through his word. Through prayer, Jesus found, he, he found solitude where he could pray. Where's your place of prayer? Where's the place you go to and you lock up in between you and God? I hope you have one. It could be out in the woods. It could be in your home. It could be a, pla a place that you go and talk with God without the TV on, without the music blasting. You know the best time to do it? What does the scripture says here? It says, while it was still dark. That's the best time to do it. When, when there's silence, that's the best time to do it. If God wakes you up 3 o'clock in the morning, that's the best time to do it. When you can't sleep at night, that's the best time to do it. Pray. Maybe God... Put uh, amnesia, whatever it is in your, your mind, rather, so that you can't sleep, so that you can pray. At least pray. Let me hear like my last point here. Jesus tells them, let us go somewhere else to the nearby village so I can preach there also. 
That is why I have come. Everybody's looking for you, Jesus. By the way, everybody want a piece of you. You know that? People will drain you. They will rob you. And once you give them all that you have, they're partying. They're getting ready for the Super Bowl. But you'll burn out. You're angry. You're mad. Because you gave your soul and heart. Let me tell you something. Jesus knew his limitations. But he also knew his mission. And the reason why we find ourselves in predicament is because we don't know our limitations. We let people come in and dictate to us and they, and they cross the boundary and we say nothing. But then later on we're complaining and we are mad with them and the whole world. Just because you treat people nice don't mean that people are going to think the same way about you. Just because you give, don't think that because you give, somebody's going to give back to you. Now, I'm not trying to tell you to be selfish here. But what I am saying, know your limitations. Know how far you can go. Know what's important to you. Sometimes we forget that. What is important to you? No, it's important for my grandkids. It's important for my neighbor. But what about you? Jesus said, we got to go somewhere else. <laughs> he said, I can stay here with all these people. They bring all the sick and all the lame to me. But, but they're not the only one that needs my help. We can learn from Jesus. There's limitations to us all. We can learn to Jesus that, 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 that the people that we help sometimes, no matter how much you help, sometimes it's not enough. You ever ran into those kind of people? The more you help, the more their hands come out. Nothing you can do for them. But what you can do is pray for them. What you can do is tell them about the Savior. What you can do allow them to go and live their lives. They're going to only learn by mistakes or whatever life is trying to teach them because I believe that life is nothing more than one big schoolroom. And, there, and there's a big chalkboard up there to say you pass or you're not passed or you need to repeat. And a lot of times we keep repeating and we're 90 years old repeating. That's not good. Jesus says, I have to take the kingdom to others. What does this tell us? There are times when the Lord will come to you, and it'll be your moment. It'll be your moment to respond to Jesus. It'll be your moment to say, yes, Lord. And if you don't, there are times when he comes to you, there are times he will move away. In other words, the intensity of that calling will not be so strong upon your heart. That means that Jesus has gone somewhere else. That's why he said, let's go somewhere else. I've given these folks all that I can give to them. They have witnessed the kingdom of God. At, at, at the, at they have seen it work. Now I must share this same kingdom of God with others. Let me close this morning by saying this. We are raised and put on this earth for a reason. We are not put on this earth to live forever. We are not put on this earth just to have babies and be happy and marry. We are not put on this earth just to gather money. We're not put on this earth so that we can enjoy the pleasures of life. Now, let me make it clear. All of these things are essential for our human life. But they are not the reason why you're put here. You are put here to honor God. You are put here to worship God. You are put here to be servants of God. 
You're put here so that the, that the same kingdom that God, that Jesus offered to them, that you have the kingdom of God in you as a Christian, you're put here to share that. In closing, I would like to say this. God has made a way that we can connect with his power. God has made a way through his son, Jesus Christ, where our sins are forgiven. Uh, God has made a way where we can have fellowship with God and with one another. God has made a way through his son and through the power of the Holy Spirit to raise us up. Don't you want some of that? Don't you want to feel that? All you need to do is ask Christ into your heart. All you need to do is surrender your life. All you have to do is quit playing church and be serious about your commitment to Christ and serving him and your relationship with him. All you have to do is say, yes, Lord. I don't know where I'm going from here, but I'm saying, yes, Lord. That's all you got to do. Let me tell you something. Along your faith journey, Jesus will often come by and he'll touch you. He'll, 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 he'll lay his hands on you. And he'll heal you. Sometimes physically, sometimes spiritually. Would you close with me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, you are awesome. As the song I listened to earlier, there is no God like you. There is no God like you. There is no God who care for us, who love us in this big, vast universe, the world included where he's able to look down and single us out, each one of us, and he knows our needs. There's no other God like that. And not only he knows our needs, you lavish us with good things, families and friends in a community, in a country, where we are free to worship. Food and clothing and transportation we take so much for granted. Our health until we are sick. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for being selfish. Forgive us for thinking that we own the world. Forgive us for thinking that we is all about ourselves. Forgive us for that mindset. And give us a servant heart to you and to the people that you have put in our lives. This we ask in Jesus' name.